is grace that we live we breathe we do what we do because God enables us to be that way and to live that way the major problem with a grace that operates prior to salvation it makes man the final determiner in his own salvation and so salvation is a matter of man and God working together so man has some ground whereby he can boast it would be right of God to destroy all of us for our sins and if he would have mercy on some he has the right to do that. In God's good providence, the plan of salvation was a tangible and effective plan of salvation. God set out to accomplish the mission of redeeming his own. Augustine said that man today is born dead in trespasses and sin. He needs to be resurrected. That we are totally incapable of doing. The reality is in scripture, God goes after people. He has sovereignly chosen. He's chosen Paul, knocks him off the horse and says, I've chosen you for this purpose. Get busy. It's a sovereign God in operation, not a lonely old man hoping people will follow him. The greatest world mission enterprises have all been initiated in the past by men who believe these great doctrines that we've been talking about of the Reformed faith. We believe that our salvation is by grace, that even the faith that we have comes as a gift from God. There is nothing that we can lay claim to, nothing in which we can boast. Our salvation entirely comes from the Lord. God, command what you will and give what you command. In other words, we are dependent upon the grace you give us to accomplish in us your own commands. The most significant issue that any human being will ever face is the question, how can I escape the judgment of God? In order for the good news to be good, it has to not just be abstract, it has to have the capacity to affect a change in us. The doctrine of Calvinism has never been defeated because it is the true exposition of Scripture. Hello, my name is Eric Holmberg, and I'll be your host for Amazing Grace, the History and Theology of Calvinism. What follows is a three-part presentation that asks, and hopefully answers, one of the most important questions the human mind can contemplate. How exactly is a fallen, fallible, and finite human, a sinner, redeemed before an infinitely just and holy God? How can a sinner be saved from the judgment of God? by the grace of God through the sacrifice for sins that was offered upon the cross. Well, uh, I think the answer to that is really what makes Christianity unique among world religions uh, because with any other system of belief, um, you know, systems that, that understand that there's a fundamental problem with man, what we would call sin, uh, there's also a, a system of works by which the practitioner needs to either prove himself or redeem himself through his works, his actions. And Christianity alone is, is the one that, that basically says you know, that, that, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. We're, we're, we're too far gone and uh, only God can, can save us at that point. The Apostle Paul probably laid it out best in Ephesians when he stated that it's by grace through faith that we're saved and that, um, that it's not by ourselves, that it's, it's Christ who did it. You know, it's, he paid the price so that no man should boast in the works that are done. Okay, but how does that work? How exactly does a person get saved? You have to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I guess in other words, that he, cru he was crucified on the cross and rose again for, and paid the price for our sins and by acknowledging him as Lord. Well, Jesus died for everyone's sins. He paid the full price to redeem us from the judgment that awaits our disobedience, which is hell. He extends the hand of salvation to everyone, and all we need to do is take it. Uh, many don't, but many do, and those that do are, are saved. You know, to answer that, I, I, I like what our pastor teaches on that. Uh, he says that you know, salvation is like a legal declaration, that God is the judge, and he's the one that declares us righteous before him. Um, Satan is like the accusing attorney 
Jesus is the defense attorney. But not only does Jesus uh, defend us, but he also posts the bail and and um, pays the fine. So uh, we're we're like the the jury in that respect, and we we depending on who we choose, uh, will determine our eternal destiny. The most significant issue that any human being will ever face is the question, how can I escape the judgment of God? If Jesus taught anything, he taught that each one of us will be brought before God in a final judgment, and we will be exposed to his wrath and exposed to his judgment. And that would be the supreme calamity from which to be delivered or to be rescued is, which is what the Bible means by being saved. And so if it's true that we will have to face God, and if it's true there is a judgment, then the question, how can I escape that judgment, becomes the most important question I will ever have to deal with. All of this raises another related question. Who gets the glory in this process of redeeming man from his sins and pardoning him from the judgment those sins deserve? 100% God. It's God and God alone. Who else but God? He's, Jesus is the only way. He's the only sacrifice for sins. If we were to survey the over one billion people in the world who call themselves Christians, when we got down to the nitty gritty of their beliefs concerning these two vital questions, we'd likely find more than a little confusion. And while most would probably answer the second question correctly, that God alone gets the glory, more often than not, this response wouldn't be theologically consistent with the details of their first answer. God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. By faith man lives and is made righteous, not by what he does for himself. Be it adoration of relics, singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome, purchase of pardon for his sins, but by faith in what God has done for him already through his son. Dr. Martin, if you leave the Christian to live only by faith, if you sweep away all good works, all these glorious things you dismiss as mere crutches, what will you put in their place? Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. The debate concerning this vital issue is as old as Christianity itself. And in today's relativistic to each his own world, many simply resolve the issue by either accepting the contradiction or just sweeping it under the proverbial rug. But in the end, neither option is acceptable. The issues are far too critical to our understanding of the true nature of man, grace, and the God we're called to worship and serve. With this in mind, this presentation will attempt to illuminate, if not resolve, the issue, while demonstrating just how amazing saving grace truly is. We'll begin in part one of this presentation with the history of this controversy, the struggle to understand God's sovereignty and grace in relation to man's responsibility and free will. In part two, we'll focus on the Bible's testimony concerning these issues. And in part three, we'll explain how the gospel should be understood and presented in light of these biblical truths. The hope here is that you, the viewer, will be inspired and better prepared to do your part in fulfilling the Great Commission. At the end, we'll also direct you to books and ministries, which can further your understanding of the system of doctrine known as Calvinism, Augustinianism, or what the Reverend John Newton, author of the classic Christian hymn, called the Gospel of Amazing Grace. May God use this video in some small way to inflame his church with the fire of worship and evangelism that was the Great Awakening. As we now turn to the fascinating history that surrounds the mystery of grace, focusing particularly on the controversies that arise whenever mystery is present, we would do well to remember the philosopher George Santayana's famous observation. Those who cannot remember the past 
are condemned to repeat it. By examining the past, we may, by God's grace, avoid its mistakes and draw wisdom and encouragement from its victories. Also, pay close attention to the way the controversies help both to define as well as provide a type of incarnational context to the theological issues that undergirded them. That will go a long way in helping make the biblical analysis of part two more interesting, comprehensible, and memorable. Now, some may ask, why begin with the historical survey of the debate instead of going right to the testimony of Scripture? Well, by neglecting the creeds, councils, and other vital facets of the church's rich 2,000-year-old history, many Christians have fallen into the trap of having to rediscover what the Bible says. Consider, for example, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, better known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. At one time or another, most of us have answered our front door only to find two smiling, conservatively dressed members of this group ready to either bear witness to Jehovah or to engage in theological debate. Should the latter take place, one quickly learns that the Jesus they teach is a very different person from the one worshipped by true Christians. Theirs is a man with no pretense of being God. According to their organization's teachings, Jesus was the first being created by Jehovah and that prior to his incarnation through Mary, he existed as the created being known as Michael the Archangel. What many do not know is that 1700 years ago, this doctrine, with a few variations, was called Arianism after its chief proponent, Arius as his rationalized version of Jesus is not God theology began to spread like a cancer. A group of more than 300 pastors, elders, and deacons came together in the city of Nicaea to discuss his views. The conclusion of that meeting, or council, was the condemnation of Arius and his teaching. Thanks to the tireless labors of great defenders of biblical faith, most notably Athanasius, Within a generation, the heresy was largely defeated and contained, and so it remained for many centuries. Think about it. If the leaders of the church in the late 1800s had brought down the whole weight of the Word of God as taught by the men of Nicaea and that were continually affirmed in subsequent councils, the Jehovah's Witnesses may have faded from the scene as quickly as they came. Please note that we are not equating church councils as being equal in authority with the Bible. Dr. R.C. Sproul explains, although tradition does not rule our interpretation, it does guide it. If, upon reading a particular passage, you have come up with an interpretation that has escaped the notice of every other Christian for 2,000 years, or has been championed by universally recognized heretics, chances are pretty good that you'd better abandon your interpretation. Why have so many in the modern church forsaken the treasures of wisdom and experience won by Christians in centuries past? Some blame an overreaction to the errors of Roman Catholicism, where the traditions and councils of the church were elevated to be virtually equivalent to the Word of God. Unfortunately, in reacting against the Roman view, Many Christians have allowed the pendulum to swing to the other extreme. Ignoring church history altogether, they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Remembrance and forgetfulness is one of the primary themes throughout the scriptures. When God's people forget, they stumble and fall. When they remember, they're able to set their focus on the things of God. That's why in the Psalms we're told that uh, Righteousness cannot be done in a land of forgetfulness. When we don't know our past, when we don't know the greatest lessons that the church has ever learned and the greatest works that have ever been written, when some new heresy, which is really just an old heresy, comes along, we're caught by surprise. Christians of all ages should be willing to learn from those who have gone before us. 
The Bible says that Christ gives gifts to his church, including teachers. And those teachers are not just the elders and pastors of a local congregation, but men who have throughout history been entrusted with great ability to understand the word of God and to teach that word. It is the height of arrogance for us to close our ears to or ignore what God taught our fathers. He has taught those who have gone before us. We stand on their shoulders. We ought to be willing to learn from them. And so what councils have declared, what teachers have uh, made known, the lessons that have stood the test of time, we ought to be willing to consider those and weigh those, not as final authority, not as an equal authority with the Word of God at all, but to measure them in the light of what the Word says. Uh, I think that is simply the Berean spirit, that is humility, that is what Christ would require of His disciples of any generation. And this is precisely what we'll attempt to do throughout this presentation. Examine church history in light of the testimony of Scripture. As Jesus prophesied, the early church suffered many trials and tribulations, most of them at the hands of the Pharisees and the Romans. However, as time passed and the church grew, the greatest trials were to come from within the church itself. Every so often a heretic would rise up, savage wolves in the words of the Apostle Paul, who would come from within the church and not spare the flock, speaking perverse things in order to draw away disciples after themselves. There is a cycle that commonly occurs with the introduction of false doctrines. First, a person or group of persons from within the Christian community begin to challenge the already established teachings of the church. This is important to understand. Heresies invariably arise in direct opposition to what is already being proclaimed throughout the body of believers. Second, the heresy is presented and then spread through the use of books, tracts and letters, and verbal proclamation. After the spurious teaching has gained enough followers and created sufficient controversy to warrant a response, a council of senior leaders, pastors, teachers, and deacons is then convened to search the scriptures to find out whether these things were so. In Acts 15, for example, we see just such a council meeting convened in this case to settle the question of how much of the Hebrew law a Gentile believer had to obey. And finally, a statement would be drawn up showing how and why the new doctrine would pervert an essential part of the gospel. This is how creeds and confessions were developed. They were essentially a formal response to false or controversial teachings. During the 5th century of the Christian era, a new controversy arose that shook the church. It started when the premier theologian of the time, Aurelius Augustine, also known as St. Augustine of Hippo, wrote a simple prayer that began to circulate throughout Christendom. Lord, give what thou commandest, and command what thou wilt. A British monk by the name of Pelagius vehemently disagreed with the prayer. He declared that God would never give a command unless man was capable of his own free will and ability to accomplish it. He further maintained that man was not overcome by sin to the point where he could do nothing to satisfy God. Tracing his ideas back to their logical beginning, Pelagius went on to assert that no one was contaminated by the fall, nor were they born in sin. But a baby instead was tabula rosa, Latin for a blank sheet of paper, and was therefore perfectly capable of obeying and pleasing God. As this controversy between Augustine and Pelagius developed, it became increasingly clear to everyone concerned that the debate was not centered around semantics or doctrinal hair splitting. At issue were several principles at the core of the Christian belief system, doctrines concerning the fundamental nature of God, man, and the gospel. As the controversy came into clear focus, a simple, all-important question began to emerge. 
Does man need God's grace in order to stand before him in righteousness? Pelagius responded with an emphatic no. While God's help is always appreciated, it's not absolutely necessary. Man can simply exercise his free will and choose not to sin. Augustine was just as insistent when he declared, yes, man is utterly dependent upon God's grace because he has been ruined by the sin of Adam and can do absolutely nothing to redeem himself before the wrath of the infinite holy God. The stakes here were huge, as many Christian scholars, both then and later, were quick to recognize. One such scholar noted, there has never perhaps been another crisis of equal importance in church history in which the opponents have expressed the principles at issue so clearly and abstractly. The Arian dispute before the Council of Nicaea can alone compare with the Pelagian controversy. If you think about it, Augustine's prayer sounds innocent enough. Lord, give what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. What was Augustine asking of God? Augustine was recognizing that all of life is grace, that we live, we breathe, we do what we do because God enables us to be that way and to live that way. So by acknowledging our utter dependence upon God, he asks for the grace and then acknowledges, command whatever you will, give the grace to do what you command. You've commanded us to worship, Lord, grant us the ability to worship. You've commanded us to pray, grant us the ability to pray. You've commanded us to evangelize, grant us the ability to evangelize. And every real Christian at his best moment would acknowledge the rightness of both of those requests. Because when we pray, we're asking God to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. God, command what you will and give what you command. In other words, we are dependent upon the grace you give us to accomplish in us your own commands. In essence, Augustine was simply asking God for help. So why would this seemingly innocent prayer have caused such a backlash from Pelagius? He thought that this presented God in a bad light, and he also thought that it was a, an affront to, to human nature. Well, Pelagius was um, basically a moralist. Pelagius believed that man had not been so corrupted that he couldn't be perfected in this life. And the prayer that God would have to grant something to us for us to perform what he required to him was blasphemous. God had already done that. We were not so dependent upon God as to need that kind of supernatural empowering grace. What we needed is simply the act of our wills and the getting our lives together to pursue the things that God had really commanded us to do. So Pelagius uh, did not see life as being a matter of grace and only grace. For him, Christianity was basically moralism. Man could do it. So why, you don't need to pray for God to grant you that which you already have the ability to perform. With the teachings of Pelagius, humanism and its doctrine of the natural ability of man came to the forefront of Christian thought. Though it had been a dominant belief system within the Greco-Roman culture that had greatly influenced the world for many centuries, now it sprang full form into the culture of the church. Pelagius, as a humanist, believed that each person was created like a new Adam, perfect, untethered by the influence of a sinful nature, and perfectly capable of obeying the commands of God. Of course, many do choose to sin from time to time, and so, Jesus' atonement provided a real benefit to them. Understanding this, man could then use his own intelligence and free will to choose forgiveness in Christ without any necessary assistance from outside himself. Pelagius rejected the idea that there was any connection between Adam and what the books call his posterity. That means all the persons that have been born uh, after him. But that Adam sinned for himself and for himself alone and that all of us are born with the same powers that Adam had. What Pelagius denied was what the apostolic church labeled original sin. Original sin is the biblical teaching that states as a result of the fall in which Adam died spiritually and ultimately physically, all of those born after Adam carry within themselves a corrupt nature and the guilt of Adam's first sin. And if you 
ignore or deny the doctrine of original sin, the doctrine of the fall, and the fallen nature of man as being in his unregenerate state, dead in trespasses and sins. If you deny that and see him as in the same state as Adam was at his creation, then you're going to produce and create an entire superstructure of theology which is all wrong. And that's why I think the Pelagian heresy was so important. So what impact would Pelagius' teaching have had upon the church if the leaders at that time had not spoken out against him? Listen again to Dr. Kennedy. If Pelagius were right and man today is born in the same way that Adam was created, that is, Adam was created, we believe, immortal and sinless, and if we were created in the same way today, then we don't need Christ. We don't need a Savior. Only sinners need a Savior. And according to Pelagius, sin was not inevitable. In fact, he believed and taught that there were many who never committed a single sin. This, of course, led to the question, did these men who never sinned die? Pelagius' answer sent him further away from the heart of Orthodox Christianity. He asserted that death was a natural occurrence even to Adam, and that Adam would have eventually died even if he had never sinned. By combining the teaching that man has a will void of the consequences of the fall and the denial of man's sin nature, as Dr. Kennedy already noted, Pelagius made salvation by grace through faith unnecessary. As this controversy spread, those called to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, convened a council to deal with it. Meeting in the northern African city of Carthage in 412 AD, both sides were present to argue their case. In the end, the council overwhelmingly agreed with Augustine. According to the word of God, man was conceived and brought forth in sin. Man's will was not in any way free according to the doctrine of Pelagius, but was instead in bondage to his sinful nature. As a result of the fall, given the opportunity to choose between good and evil, God or the devil, the unregenerate man would always and freely choose evil and the devil unless God himself intervened. Pelagius, as well as anyone who followed his teaching, were condemned as heretics. The decision of this council reads in part, whoever says that Adam was created mortal and would, even without sin, have died by natural necessity, let him be anathema. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death. Death was promised as a result of disobedience. And one of the chief evidences that we are all sinners and it is set forth all the way through scripture is that death is a common occurrence. Physical death, which is an indication that we all are living in a corruptible state of spiritual death. Well, when Pelagius and Celestius taught that men were mortal from the beginning and would have died whether they had sinned or not, this seemed to remove the, uh, what, what was a biblical evidence for the veracity of God in placing the curse on a disobedient humanity. If unfallen man had died anyway, then that means that the threat of God for disobedience would have been basically nonsense. To our modern pluralistic ears, declaring that someone should be anathema or accursed for holding a sincere doctrinal viewpoint sounds bizarre, even unchristian. Again, Dr. Nettles responds. Well, when these councils end some of these uh, decisions with let him be anathema, they're picking the phrase up from the, the biblical example in Galatians 1, where Paul talks about, if anyone preach a gospel to you other than that which I've preached, let him be anathema. In other words, let that person be cut off from the church, but the real meaning is let that person be cut off from the possibility of salvation. Because Paul understood this to be something that was a destruction of the gospel. Uh, and so when the church uh, uses that kind of language, whether or not it's legitimate for a church council to do that is another question, but what they're trying to say is that this is an issue that is so important that we feel that if a person believes this, they actually are destroying an essential aspect of the gospel.
And so it is better for that person simply to be cut off from the church than to allow them uh, to continue to teach and have the possibility of destroying souls. In total, three councils condemn Pelagianism in all its forms. Six years after the Council of Carthage, a general council of African churches reaffirmed the anathemas of 412 AD. Unfortunately, in the interval between these two councils, the Bishop of Rome, Zosimus, sided with Pelagius. In 412, he wrote a letter condemning the council at Carthage for their anathema of Pelagius. Of course, understanding that they had the support of Scripture, the leaders of the Carthaginian council disregarded the bishop and his letter. Philip Schaff, noted church historian, observes, this temporary favor of the Bishop of Rome towards the Pelagian heresy is a significant presage of the indulgence of later popes for Pelagianizing tendencies. It was these Pelagianizing tendencies advocated by the Bishop of Rome that allowed for the later development of the works righteousness in the Roman Catholic belief system. This can perhaps be best illustrated by the life and writings of Cornelius Otto Jansen a leader of the post-Reformation movement within Roman Catholicism. Most of his works were published and became popular after his death in 1640. Like Martin Luther, Jansen believed that the Church of Rome had departed from the early church's position that all of life was by the grace of God. And like Augustine, he taught that man's spirit was dead in sin and therefore needed to be regenerated, what the Bible called born again. Jansen understood that this experience was something that happened to man by God's grace and not something that a man made happen by his faith. On behalf of the Pope, the Jesuits launched a violent attack on the Jansenist movement. In 1713, Pope Clement XI issued a papal bull or formal condemnation against them, denouncing 101 statements from their writings. What's troubling is that many of these statements were direct quotations from the writings of Augustine against Pelagius. How could this happen to a church that at one time sided with Augustine against Pelagius? Surely there was more than just one answer. But Philip Schaff has given us one slice of the pie. As the church continued into the Middle Ages and the Bishop of Rome became the so-called, quote, visible head of the church, end quote, these Pelagianizing tendencies metastasized and, like a cancer, began to spread. By the time we reached the Reformation, Rome was teaching that man saved himself by cooperating with the grace of God, a position known as semi-Pelagianism. Then along came the mediating view of the semi-Pelagians that said man is neither dead nor well, in this life, man is born sick. Now, if man is born well, as Pelagius said, all he needs is a little guidance, a little moral guidance in his life to stay upon the path. If man is sick, then he needs the help of a physician. And if he will cooperate with his physician, then he and the physician can effect his cure. Adam, excuse me, Augustine said that man, man today is born dead in trespasses and sin. He needs to be resurrected. That we are totally incapable of doing. So the practical result is if you are a Pelagian, all you need is a teacher. If you are semi-Pelagian, all you need is a little help from a physician. If you are an Augustinian, as I am, and most all of the historic Orthodox Church has been, then you will realize that man needs to be resurrected from the dead and that salvation, furthermore, is entirely of grace. Semi-Pelagianism is a modification of the doctrinal teaching of Pelagius. It is a synergistic rather than a monergistic approach to redemption. It basically teaches that man and God are cooperating together in order to accomplish redemption.
September 1, 1524, Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, a Roman Catholic apologist, published a work entitled Diatribe Concerning Free Will. Martin Luther, the German reformer, responded with On the Enslaved Will, or The Bondage of the Will, a masterful apologetic that referenced over 300 Bible verses. Luther maintained the full Augustinian position against the semi-Pelagian position of Erasmus. It would be difficult to overstate the significance of this book. Luther considered it to be his most important work because it spoke to the issues that went to the very heart of what it meant to be a Christian. Dr. B.B. Warfield, the great Princeton theologian, called the bondage of the will the manifesto of the Protestant Reformation. Luther's book drew a line in the sand between the Roman Catholic view of justification and the reform view, and the debate that followed became known as the monergistic, synergistic controversy. When Erasmus wrote his diatribe on free will, he was writing this against Martin Luther. The church had really knew that Luther was making some inroads, and so they wanted the greatest continental humanist to, to take aim at Luther. Erasmus hesitated for a long time, but finally he found what he thought he could conscientiously focus on, and that was Luther's recapture of Augustinian thought that we are absolutely and utterly dependent upon a sovereign working of God and that we have nothing to contribute to our own salvation. And so in this book, Erasmus opted for a view of salvation that says that God offers us grace, but we still have some elements of freedom within us, within us by which we can either choose this grace or reject this grace. And it is our choice that God rewards then with salvation. Erasmus's main thesis in his treatment of the will, this diatribe on the will, is that man has the ability to initiate the relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. He has the ability within himself to believe and through that faith then access all that goes with faith in justification and reconciliation with God. Dr. Askell explains the semi-Pelagian view of synergism. Synergism comes from a compound word in Greek, together, working together, and it basically teaches that man and God cooperate in the initiation of faith, that man does his part, God does his part, and so it's a cooperative work. The prefix sin means with or together with at the same time. It refers to two or more. It's used in words like synchronized. Ergos is a Greek word for work. In theological terms, as Dr. Askell has already noted, synergism refers to divine and human cooperation. God and man work together to bring about the latter's conversion. Martin Luther saw this as little more than a works-based salvation, dressed up in evening clothes. Luther believed the semi-Pelagianism of Erasmus denied original sin, the full impact the fall had on man. Instead of being dead in his trespasses and sins, man was, according to Erasmus, only wounded and therefore could help himself by helping God. Luther understood that Erasmus' view made the grace of God a reward for our faith. In other words, man believes the gospel, and as a result of his good work, God gives him grace. And no matter how you slice it, in the end, man deserves some of the credit or the glory for his salvation. And so it was the glory of God that was at stake in this view of salvation, according to Luther. Against the synergistic view of Erasmus, Luther believed that being born again or born from above was monergistic. Mono is the Greek word meaning one or alone. It's the prefix for words like monotheism, the belief in one God. Monergism then was the belief that regeneration or the new birth was to be understood as the work of God alone. Because man was dead in trespasses and sin, it was God, and only God, who brought man back to life, sending his spirit to revive, regenerate, and resurrect man from the hopeless condition of spiritual death.
It may be helpful at this point to briefly explain that the terms born again and what we deem as salvation or justification are not synonymous terms. Many modern day Christians equate the two. Luther emphatically taught that fallen man does not have faith in order to be born again, but that man is born again by the Spirit and the Word, and as a result, has faith. Luther rightly understood that when the Bible describes the condition of man in sin, it is a desperate condition. Man in sin is not just sick, he is dead. A sick man can help himself a little bit, but a dead man needs a supernatural, miraculous work of grace to bring him back to life. Luther recognized that, and that's why in his bondage on the will, he considered this to be the most important, significant work that he did, the most important book he ever wrote. And it's also why in the conclusion of that book, he thanks Erasmus for writing against his view and, and commending the freedom of the will. He says, Erasmus, you of all my opponents have really seen the issue. This is the hinge on which all else turns. Luther understood that it's not enough to advocate sola fide, faith alone. But sola fide also is dependent upon sola gratia, grace alone. And the faith which we exercise in Jesus Christ is itself a gift of God. And it is produced in us by the work of the Spirit. After the death of Martin Luther, the German church forged a statement of faith that outlined many of the distinctives of the Lutheran church, collected into what became known as the Book of Concord. It became the standard statement of faith for all confessing Lutheran churches. Among its articles was a clear affirmation of the monergistic position on salvation. Man of himself or from his natural powers cannot contribute anything or help to his conversion. And that conversion is not only in part, but altogether an operation, gift, and present and work of the Holy Ghost alone, who accomplishes and effects it by his virtue and power through the word in the understanding of the heart and will of man. But the formula of Concord set forth very clearly Luther's historic view that uh, it is only by the work of God's Spirit and God's Word that the human heart is changed and comes to faith in Christ. Again, the monergistic view was affirmed very strongly in the Book of Concord. In response to the challenge and growth of the Reformation, Pope Paul III convened a council on the 13th of December, 1545, in the city of Trent in what is now northern Italy. Meeting periodically over the next 18 years, this council produced many doctrinal statements that were to serve as dogma, official and supposedly infallible statements concerning faith and morality that were to bind the consciences of all true Christians. Among them was an anathema, or condemnation, declared in the fifth canon of the sixth session. If anyone says that after the sin of Adam, man's free will was lost and destroyed, let him be anathema. This acknowledgement of the semi-Pelagian doctrine of free will went straight to the heart of the dispute between the Roman church's teaching on salvation and that of the reformers. As Martin Luther observed, if any man doth ascribe aught of salvation, even the very least, to the free will of man, he knoweth nothing of grace, and he hath not learnt Jesus Christ aright. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, later echoed Luther's statement when he declared, He who in his soul believes that man does of his own free will turn to God cannot have been taught of God. Luther and the Reformers knew that the issue of free will versus the bondage of the will went to the first principle of justification, and if compromised, it would not only put man in the co-driver's seat concerning the vital issue of salvation, it would give him some of the glory for having sense enough to get saved. Now this is important because if it's not true, or if we argue against this, we're actually robbing God of his glory. Which gives God more glory? Which recognizes the greatness of his work? A helper who gives a little medicine to a sick man or a miracle worker who looks at a dead man and says, live. 
Luther recognized the glory of God in salvation is much greater than just a medicine man who gives a little aid to someone who is sick, but rather here's a miracle of grace. I was dead, I was lost, I was without hope, without help in the world, and all of those Bible verses that Luther was familiar with that teach that, he saw clearly and he took seriously, and God came and saved me. God did it, it is his work. So all praise goes to God. It's not a question of praise me for trusting Jesus and Jesus for accepting my faith and saving me. It's praise God for saving me because he quickened me, he changed me, he granted me faith and enabled me to trust his son. All praise goes to him, all glory goes to him. No praise, no glory belongs to anyone else. At the heart of the Reformed faith is uh, the phrase sola Deo Gloria, to God alone goes the glory. And I know of no other system of thought that consistently honors God and gl gives the whole glory to God, no glory to us, than what we call Reformed theology or historic Calvinism. That to me is the one that is most consistent with the biblical approach to honoring God. Many of history's greatest evangelists and preachers would agree. Among them was George Whitfield, the lightning rod of the Great Awakening, a man used by God to bring tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of souls to Christ. It was Whitfield who contended that the semi-Pelagian doctrine of free will ultimately compromised both preaching and the invitation for people to believe in the Lord Jesus. What did Whitfield mean? One of the great things about the good news that, that George Whitfield grasped when he said that the Arminian gospel is no gospel at all is that in order for the good news to be good, it has to not just be abstract, it has to have the capacity to enter into us, to, to affect a change in us. If God made it possible for us to be saved and left us in our total depravity, that's sort of hypothetical good news. To use an analogy, the semi-Pelagian free will gospel is like taking a blind man to an art auction and then offering to purchase for him the painting he considers to be the most beautiful. This, of course, would be absurd. The blind man must first be given new eyes, a feat he cannot accomplish by simply willing himself to see. Living as we do in an age that has been so influenced by humanism, many Christians today view the biblical Augustinian, Lutheran, Calvinistic, monergistic position concerning salvation as strange, unbelievable, and wrong, even heretical. They would do well to consider what else and who else they would have to dismiss as also being in error. History is filled with champions of the faith who considered the synergistic view of free will as being directly opposed to both God's sovereignty and the true gospel. Ironically, many are revered by lots of modern day semi-Pelagians, Protestant and Roman Catholic alike. Among these defenders of the reformed view of free will and salvation are Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, pastor of Westminster Chapel in London. Jonathan Edwards, another key leader of the Great Awakening. John Bunyan, pastor and author of the classic work, Pilgrim's Progress. August Toplady, writer of the classic hymn, Rock of Ages. Dr. John Owen, arguably England's greatest nonconformist pastor and theologian. William Wilberforce, English parliamentarian and champion of the abolition of slavery. John A. Brodus, namesake of Broadman Press. J.P. Boyce, founder of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. B.H. Carroll, founder of Southwestern Theological Seminary. Roger Williams, pastor and founder of the very first Baptist church in America. William Carey, the Baptist minister known as the father of modern missions. John Fox, author of Fox's Book of the Martyrs. The great Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle. A.W. Pink, influential author and Baptist minister. Dr. Francis Schaeffer, author of the classic How Shall We Then Live? John Newton, writer of the classic hymn Amazing Grace. 
Matthew Henry of the Matthew Henry Commentary on the Whole Bible, and Charles Spurgeon, pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London and known as the Prince of Preachers. And these are just a few. Other champions could be mentioned who currently serve the church today. Among them, J.I. Packer, D. James Kennedy, R.C. Sproul, Albert Moeller, John MacArthur, and John Piper. And then there are the great confessions of faith that have guided and illuminated the church for centuries, each decisively monergistic. The Waldensian Creed, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, the aforementioned Book of Concord, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Baptist Confession of 1689. We could go on and on. The greatest eras of, of, of evangelism, the greatest evangelistic movements, culture-changing evangelistic movements, the greatest world mission enterprises have all been uh, initiated in the past by men who've believed these great doctrines that we've been talking about of the Reformed faith. Unfortunately, many in the church refuse to heed these counsels, and the cycles of false teaching continue to revolve. As the gap between Rome and the reformers grew, attempts were made, consciously and unconsciously, to find a compromise between the two positions. The next cycle of false teaching, this time growing up from within the ranks of the Protestant movement, involved a very sincere man by the name of James Arminius. Arminius was born in Uitwater in the Netherlands. He became a pastor of an Amsterdam congregation and a professor at the University of Leiden from 1603 until his death in 1609. During the course of his life, Arminius rejected many of the teachings of the Reformation and returned to the semi-Pelagian view of Rome. In 1610, one year after Arminius' death, his followers drafted five articles of faith based upon his teachings. These five points of what came to be called Arminianism stood in contradistinction to what the Church of Holland had been teaching since the Reformation. These five articles, also called the Remonstrance or Protest, were then presented to the Reformed Church. The Arminian party insisted that the Church's statements of faith, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism, be adapted to conform to the five points of Arminianism. In November of 1618, a national synod or council was convened in the city of Dort for the purpose of examining the views of the Arminian party. 84 members and 18 civil commissioners, including 27 delegates from Germany, Switzerland, England, and elsewhere, were in attendance. From the first day until the synod's close in May of 1619, some 154 sessions were held. The result was an overwhelming rejection of the five points of Arminianism. Since the Arminian attack had been so focused and severe, the men who were part of the Synod believed a mere rejection of the five points of Arminianism would be insufficient to stem the tide of error. They therefore responded to each of the five points in turn, formulating what has come to be called the five points of Calvinism. What the Synod of Dort did was to reaffirm the confessional statement that already existed in the Dutch Reformed Church, and they reaffirmed it in light of the particular objections that the Remonstrants had brought against it. It's known today as the five points of Calvinism, but Calvin didn't sit down one day and say, I'm going to write my theology in five points and then write out these five points. But the reason they came out as five distinct points was because it was in response to the objections of the Arminians or the, the Remonstrants. Dr. J.I. Packer, author of the classic work Knowing God, summarized the Arminian position 
as put forth by the remonstrance. Number one, man is never so completely corrupted by sin that he cannot savingly believe the gospel when it's put before him. Number two, man is never so completely controlled by God that he cannot reject God's grace. Number three, election is as a result of God, looking down the quarters of time, foreseeing that a sinner will accept Christ. Therefore, God elects those who first elect him. Number four, Christ's death did not ensure the salvation of anyone, for it did not secure the gift of faith, for the remonstrance there was no such gift. What it did was rather to create a possibility of salvation for everyone if they would only choose to believe. And number five, it ultimately rests with the believers to keep themselves in a state of grace by keeping up their faith. Those who fail here fall away and are lost. Dr. Packer concludes, Arminianism made man's salvation depend ultimately on man himself, saving faith being viewed throughout as man's own work. In essence, Arminianism recaptured the synergistic position of semi-Pelagianism and Roman Catholicism, teaching that salvation is accomplished through the combined efforts of God, who takes the initiative, and man, who must respond, with man's response being the ultimate determining factor. God has provided salvation for everyone, but His provision becomes effective only for those who of their own free will choose to cooperate with Him and accept his free offer of grace. At the crucial point, man's will plays a decisive role, the catalyst or active ingredient. Thus, man's good work, and not God's, determines who will be recipients of the gift of grace. The Synod of Dort, as we've seen, responded to the five points of the Arminian party with what is known today as the five points of Calvinism. We'll wait until the next section to examine each of these points in detail, but in essence they are as follows. Number one, total depravity in response to the Arminian view of free will. Number two, unconditional election in contradistinction to conditional election. Number three, particular or what is commonly referred to as limited atonement in opposition to general or universal atonement. Number four, irresistible grace in reply to resistible grace. And number five, perseverance of the saints in answer to the idea that a saved man could be unsaved. In short, the leaders at the Synod of Dort, like Luther, Calvin, and Augustine, taught that salvation is accomplished by the almighty power of the triune God. The Father chooses or elects people to be saved. The Son redeems them through His cross. And the Holy Spirit makes Christ's death effective by bringing the elect to faith and repentance, thereby causing them willingly to believe the gospel. The entire process is the work of God and is by and through grace alone. Thus, God's grace and not man's good work determines who will be saved. The leaders assembled at Dort understood that the five points of Arminianism were on shaky ground, that if one point were proven wrong, the entire system would collapse. The Arminians were ejected out of the church. Over 300 ministers were expelled as a result of their disagreement with the doctrinal teaching of the Dutch church. That teaching was Reformational theology or Calvinism as it is more popularly known. The Synod of Dort taught that salvation from beginning to end was a work of God's grace alone. They believed that Adam's fall had ruined the whole race and plunged man into spiritual death that entangled his will in bondage to sin and Satan. To teach that man could save himself by an exercise of his will apart from the grace of God, which is Pelagianism, or contribute to his own salvation by having man cooperate with the grace of God, which is semi-Pelagianism, was heresy a giant step away from the Reformation 
and back towards Roman Catholicism. The reformers felt that if they acquiesced to the protests or the remonstrations of the uh, Arminians at that time, that in a very real way they would have been putting their feet back on a path to Rome. Now let me clarify that. I don't think any of them believed that Arminianism was or is today Roman Catholicism. We're talking about putting your feet on a path that goes in a certain direction. Now, the big difference between historic Arminianism and Roman Catholicism is that Arminianism does believe and affirms categorically the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That is, a, an orthodox Arminian believes that the grounds for his justification, for his salvation, is not his own righteousness, but the righteousness that has been won for him by the work of Jesus Christ. However, when you get down to the nitty-gritty and you push Arminianism to its logical conclusion, there is where you see the uh, extreme danger of slipping into a works righteousness. And if once you acknowledge free will, which Luther and all of the other reformers denied, then you open the door for all of the various Roman Catholic heresies that came along as well as that one. So did the reformers believe that man had a will, one that's free to choose one thing over another without the necessary intrusion of some outside force? Again, Dr. Kennedy. Are total depravity and free will compatible? Yes and no. As we said to an earlier question, free will can mean one of two things. If we're talking about the sense in which free will exists in every human being, whether regenerate or unregenerate, then we could say, yes, obviously they're compatible because unregenerate people do make choices. That's the sense in which man is free to choose whatever he wants to choose. All men are free to do that. The unregenerate man makes choices every day, what tie he'll wear, what he'll eat for dinner, whatever it may be. Uh, <clears throat> and but in the sense in which it, the significant sense in which it's used in the Bible, which is man is free to do what he ought to do, which is repent of his sins, turn from his wickedness, <clears throat> surrender his life to Christ, and follow him in godliness, man, unregenerate man, is not free to do that. The more he hears of it, the more he dislikes it. And he, his will and heart and mind must be changed for him to do that. The reformers believed that man did have a will, and they believed that man's will is free to choose one thing over another without the necessary intrusion of some outside force. What they objected to was the Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, and Arminian view of free will. They unequivocally held that as a result of the fall, man's will was now in bondage to sin and death and has lost the ability apart from the outside influence of God's grace, to choose the perfect good in relation to the spiritual realm. Rather than a God-centered will, a will that desires to please and honor the Lord as the prima facie motivation for everything man says, does, and thinks, the fallen will is ultimately grounded in self. And while this self may and often does choose things that are relatively good and that can occasionally even outwardly approximate the moral perfection modeled by Jesus, in the consuming fire of God's perfect sight, fallen man's most righteous deeds are as filthy rags, corrupted by the leaven of a self-directed will. In the end, man is free to choose, but can of necessity only choose from among the things that his fallen nature will of its own accord consider. Dying to self and living wholeheartedly for the true God is not something that would ever show up on fallen man's radar screen of options. In spite of all the councils, synods, creeds, and confessions created to deal with this issue, most of the Bible-believing church today is Arminian. Of course, most are not consistent with respect to many aspects of their theology. People pray, for example, 
as if God were truly sovereign and omnipotent, leading the great Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, to famously declare, You have heard a great many Arminian sermons, I dare say, but you've never heard an Arminian prayer. For the saints in prayer appear as one in word and deed and mind. An Arminian on his knees would pray desperately like a Calvinist. With his tongue planted firmly in his cheek, Spurgeon then went on to explain that if an Arminian were to pray in a way consistent with his free will theology, he would sound something like this. Lord, I thank thee that I am not like those poor presumptuous Calvinists. Lord, I was born with a glorious free will. I was born with power by which I can turn to thee of myself. I have improved my grace. If everybody had done the same with their grace that I have, they might all have been saved. Thou givest grace to everybody. Some do not improve it, but I do. There are many who will go to hell as much bought with the blood of Christ as I was. They had as much of the Holy Ghost given to them. They had as good a chance and were as much blessed as I am. It was not thy grace that made us to differ. I know it did a great deal, still I turned the point. I made use of what was given me, and others did not. This is the difference between me and them. Of course, no true Christian would ever dare to utter such nonsense, blasphemy really, to the Lord. But if you're an Arminian, you need to think through your presuppositions. Though you would never say it with your mouth, isn't this where your theology ultimately leads? The Apostle Paul declared that there is no room in the gospel for boasting. Arminianism at its root allows for it. Thankfully, more and more Bible-believing Christians today are coming to understand the doctrines of sovereign free grace and are now making their boasts in the Lord. The doctrine of Calvinism has never been defeated because you can't defeat the Scripture. Calvin's teaching is the true teaching of Christ, Paul, as they are presented in the Scripture. Thus, it is impossible to defeat this teaching. You might defeat hyper-Calvinism, a perversion of Calvinism, but you cannot defeat Calvin's theology because it is the true exposition of Scripture.